<laughs> okay, thank you, Martin. Um, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Carl Marlanis. And the, uh, the reason I'm up here is because he and I served in the same infantry battalion in Vietnam in 1969. And uh, that was 1st Battalion, 4th Marines. And we had the pleasure of operating in the very northwest corner of what was then the Republic of North, uh, sorry, the Republic of Vietnam, right along the Laotian border in what was laughingly referred to as the de demilitarized zone. Um, I'd also like to introduce two other of our colleagues, uh, Jack Higgins and Tim Rabbit, who are also served in that battalion at this time. Uh, several years ago, Carl um, asked me if I would review the manuscript for his novel, Matterhorn. And if I liked it, if I would write a blurb. So I was uh, agreed, and I was soon immersed in one of the truly great uh, works of war fiction that I'd ever read. And here's what, a part of what I wrote for the publisher. No other novel about Vietnam, including Jim Webb's Field of Fire, does a better job of capturing the essence of what it meant to be a grunt in Vietnam than Matterhorn. Matterhorn is a powerful work of literature and a tribute to those who fought and died at the end of the line. Now, I have to confess that also I thought it was extremely powerful. I somehow didn't think that a novel about an unpopular war written in the midst of another other popular war was going to be very, there was going to be much of a market for it. So, so Carl has to be very thankful that I wasn't his literary agent because, of course, it became a, you know, became a bestseller. Uh, Carl's a very remarkable fellow and something of an anomaly among Vietnam veterans. He's a graduate of Yale, and when everybody else in the Ivy League was headed for the hills and trying to avoid service, um, he gave up a, basically a, a Rhodes Scholar scholarship, which was reinstated later to come home and fight. For his actions in Vietnam, he was awarded the Navy Cross. I like to call it the non-posthumous Medal of Honor. And uh, two Purple Hearts. He became a successful businessman after the war, but admits to having to deal with the demons that accompanied him home from Vietnam. And that's one of the reasons that he wrote both Matterhorn and what it is like to go to war. You may remember that uh, when Admiral McRaven was here last week, he spoke about something called hard combat and how long exposure to hard combat changes a person. This is the central theme of what it is like to go to war. In this book, uh, Carl describes quite candidly what it means to sojourn in what he calls the Temple of Mars, where he writes, I experienced a surprising love for those who entered with me. There I prayed for deliverance from horror, carnage, and death. He ends with a discussion of how it might be possible for citizens of a modern liberal society such as the United States, to better relate to Mars. The underlying organizing power that creates and sustains those physical and terrible aspects of war that seem beyond the comprehensive, comprehensive comprehension of our small psyches. Carl suggests that one of the reasons for writing what it is like to go to war was to share the experience of hard combat with other veterans so as to help them with their own quest for meaning and their efforts to integrate their combat experiences in their current lives as well as to convey to those about to join the military what war is really like. As he remarks, the violence of combat assaults psyches, confuses ethics, and tests souls. This is not only a result of the violence suffered, it is also the result of the violence inflicted. Along these lines, I should note that Carl has teamed up with writer and um, um, a movie maker um, Sebastian Junger to press for the creation of a national commission to deal with the past 12 years of war in a way, as Carl puts it, a more sober and meaningful way than having another picnic on Memorial Day weekend. It's important to note that although uh, Carl turns his own experiences in Vietnam, it is not per se about Vietnam, it is about war in general. For far too long, Vietnam has been singled out as somehow unique in the history of warfare. Uh, the fact is, however, that Vietnam was no more brutal than other wars, the, the war in the Pacific, and what many of you in this audience have, uh, have, have basically experienced in Afghanistan and, and Iraq. And that's what makes Carl, what Carl has to say, all the more important. Unfortunately for the utopians among us, barbarism exists in the world. Civilization can uh, suppress barbarism and savagery, but cannot eradicate it. Thus, war is not an aberration. Carl writes that as long as there are people who will kill for gain and power, the United States will need soldiers who will kill to stop them. But this requires honesty about war and its cost, especially 
in terms of the split that war creates in the soul of the soldier. In Parzival, Wolfram von Essenbach captures the nature of this psychological split engendered by war. Shame and honor clash where the courage of the steadfast man is motley like the magpie. But such a man may yet make merry, for heaven and hell have equal parts of him. Please join me in welcoming Carl Marlantis to the Naval War College. One last uh, logistical announcement. For those of you who have copies of either of Carl's books, if you'd like to get them signed, he'll go to the table out in the foyer at the conclusion of this, this session at three. So please feel, to, feel free to do that. Um, I first saw Carl on uh, the Bill Moyer show on public television. Uh, it was an extraordinary interview. Um, so as we talked about the format for this, uh, after some discussion, he concluded he'd rather do something rather like that than to give a formal presentation. So to that end, I prepared some questions for him, and uh, uh, he's seen them in advance, so he'd have an opportunity to think about them. Uh, I won't necessarily march through all of them. I want to make sure you have plenty of time to interact as well, but let me give, uh, let's get us started. You begin your book talking a lot about uh, something we all know, that there's this great inhibition to talk about combat experience, both on the part of the returning combat veteran and often on the part of their civilian counterparts as well, who may want to thank you but don't really want to hear right. the details. Um, can you say a little about where you think that comes from and what good and harm it does? Well, you know, there's, I only say it half facetiously. I mean, in our culture, there's, there's, there's a great amount of inhibition against two things. One is whining and the other one is uh, bragging. And uh, my experience of combat is that it's 99% things to whine about and 1% things to brag about. So it doesn't, but it doesn't leave you very much room to say anything if you have this, this cultural <laughs> inhibition against those two things. Uh, I think on a more serious level, uh, what happens is, is that you come back and, and uh, you've done terrible things. Now you've done terrible things for hopefully the right reason, but that doesn't take away the fact that you've done terrible things. And uh, you're the one that bears the burden. Uh, and, and you're a little bit worried uh, about, do I really wanna you know, say this? And when is it appropriate to actually say something? I mean, if you say it, something about, well, you know, this is what happened to me in Fallujah at dinner. Well, I'm afraid the dinner party's dead, right? You know, it's over. Uh, and so there's a great deal of inhibition on the part of, of the returning veteran uh, to talk about the real stuff because you don't know how people are going to react to it. You don't know if you're going to really be judged and who likes to be judged. And so you throw that into complaining and whining and uh, there's a lot of inhibition on the part of the veteran to just even talk about it. On the other side, people of goodwill are, are reticent to ask because it's like, you know, I don't want to disturb him. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to make him angry. Uh, I, I. I don't want to. You know, uh, confront anything or, you know, I don't want to get into politics. Uh, and so everybody sort of clams up on the other side, and it's it's damaging. And the reason it's damaging is because the fundamental issue of the returning veteran is to get back into the community, and. You know, what we used to call primitive societies had all kinds of rituals that, that brought warriors back into the community. And uh, uh, we don't have them anymore. We have to sort of figure out how to do it on our own. And, uh, you know, as, as, was, as, as Mac was saying, it's, it's um, a, sort of having picnics on Memorial Day is not doing the job. And so uh, we have, uh, you know, this silence, which uh, I wrote a whole chapter about called the, the Club of Silence, and uh, we just have to start to break it down. Um, I had a really interesting experience. I'm trying to do this commission, and we had a, the launch, and there were probably about 100 people in the room, and uh, Sebastian and I are up on the, on the stage doing, you know, Q&A, and, 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 and uh, Colin Powell's uh, chief of staff, whose name went right out of my head, why well, I could never run for politics. Um, the, and at the end of this, uh, sort of toward the end of this, a, a, a Vietnam veteran clearly stood up and just unloaded, I mean, anger. And you could just see everybody in the room just, 
just recoiling. And he stomped out. And I said, I asked, I said, how many people have ever, ever talked to a, an angry veteran? None. None. And that's what's the, that's a problem, isn't it? It's like, it's like, well, they go over there and they do their thing, they come back, but they'll have to deal with that themselves. And so one of the ideas of this commission, if I can make a plug, is that it will go out to the community and, and in fact have the community involved and actually have to start confronting that the Republic's been at war, not just the military. You know, you came back from a very unpopular and highly politicized war, and you're pretty graphic about the, the yes. um, being spit on in the BART in San Francisco and you know, the reception that you got. Um, the veterans in this room come from a military that is, as we heard this morning, the most trusted institution in this society, but also from a war that's been fought kind of out of sight and out of mind of the American people. So how do you think their experience is going to be fun different from yours? Well, um, you know, I, I think that uh, moving from hostility to indifference is, is an improvement. And, um, <laughs> but indifference is not exactly where we want to be, and I think that's where we are right now. I mean, certainly, I mean, there's small towns in America that welcome their, their returning veterans. But in general, I mean, if you, you know, the, the vast majority of the population, uh, I think that, that the returning veteran is, is, is feeling a sort of... Uh, I don't know what the right feel. We were just talking about it last night. I mean, it's like when someone comes up to you at the airport and thank you for your service. It just, for me, I don't know about you guys, but for me, it's just like, you know, that's what you do when you thank the waiter for bringing you your coffee. You know, thank you for your service. It's just, it's just not, I mean, it just isn't there, is it? It's, 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 it's. And so the veterans are going to have to deal with that. They're going to have to deal with the fact that, quite frankly, until this nation starts to get a, a shift in its consciousness about having been at war, it basically uh, is going to be a very difficult thing for the returning veterans to do. Um, I think another issue is that, of course, the vast majority of veterans from Vietnam were drafted. And when they came back, they were done. Uh, the vast majority of people coming back from these wars are, are uh, professionals and they're going back, they're still in. And that's a very big different thing too because you run into this, this issue of things like uh, reintegration into the culture and society. Well, it's very easy to reintegrate back into your military culture, but, uh, and the military culture is increasingly separated from the general culture. Because of the, there's no draft anymore, and so I think that is something that current returning veterans are going to have to deal with, that uh, the Vietnam veterans didn't. So it's a, uh, uh, and then then there are the fundamentals of all wars. I mean, if you read the Odyssey, I mean, Odysseus was clearly suffered with post-traumatic stress. I mean, you can just read it, and and Homer understood it. Those things will never go away. Uh, the tension and 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 the killing, and uh, those those are the same. You know, one very strong theme throughout your book is, this, is a, for lack of a better word, the spirituality of war. Um, you mentioned already the reintegration ceremonies for warriors in, in other cultures, like uh, you give some Native American examples. Uh, part of your commission idea is to create a sort of modern, secular version of those things for your veterans. Could you share some of the thoughts you have about what might be effective if, if it's not the Veterans Day picnic? <laughs> Yeah, um, I think that, that for example, uh, an idea of, of a solemnity, um, we have it wrong. Uh, one of the great things about being a writer is that I can say anything I want because a politician has to say, I wonder what they think I ought to think. You know, I don't, you know this is what I think, you're going to get it. It ain't football. And we treat it like football. So when people come home, we've got to stop treating it like football. And CNN and ABC have got to start, you know, day 17, the Iraq war. Dun, 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 dun. I mean, I'm coming like, what are you guys are insane? This is some, we're killing people over there. You know, and I'm not saying that because of some kind of moral judgment. It's like, you know, war, some are for it, some are against it. I mean, I happen to be for that one. Um, it's really, but the thing is, is that you can't treat it like football. So the first thing that I would do is I would like to see a change in the way that we mark the ends of war and the return of the, of the, of the warriors from war. And my image is um, that you solemnly have a parade where the rifles are turned upside down, where the sword is, sword is sheathed, and uh, that you're not cheering because these people 
have themselves been wounded, they've lost their friends, and let's face it, a lot of uh, civilians have been killed and a lot of the enemy have been killed. And when you pull back from a war, you have to start to realize that the enemy that you killed were probably misguided people, mostly kids, and uh, they end up blowing themselves up because some, some guy at the top decides that they should blow themselves up. So are you going to cheer about that? And then America cheers about it. And so I think the, the beginning is to start a, is to get rid of that. You know, a question I've often pondered is whether the kinds of things you just expressed about the sort of tragic nature of war, the fact that combatants on both sides are probably young and not well informed and somewhat misguided, um, it, it's clearly true. And it's clearly a reflection that people our age find fairly easy to make. Mm -hmm. Is it, it, can a 19 year old go to war with that attitude? Well, you know, um, I had a guy ask a question. He was, he was, he was a lot meaner than you are. I was at a reading and it, and it was, it was, it was a, 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 clearly a retired military guy. I could, he didn't identify which branch of the service. Like, but anyway, he, he, uh, uh, he, he was like, oh, I get it. He was being sarcastic. And he says, you wrote this book. And he says, you know, it, it's, it's like when, when we're, when we're in the sophomores in high school and people say that we're now going to teach you Shakespeare and, and Tolstoy. And, and, you know, we don't give a damn about that. And we don't understand it. But they always tell us that, that someday when we grow up, we'll be able to understand it. That's what your book's all about. And I looked at him and I said, yes. 19-year-olds <laughs> are our best warriors. Absolutely. I mean, you give me a platoon of 35-year-olds versus 19-year-olds. Are you kidding me? You know? Oh, God, Lieutenant, let's think about this, you know? <laughs> but your 19-year-olds, they're not going to be reflecting on this. But if you can, if you can plant the seeds, if, if someone had planted the seeds for me when I was that young, when I started doing crazy behavior at the age of 40, you know, 15, 20 years after the battle, I'd have gone, oh, that's what they were talking about. And I might have gotten help faster. I might have healed faster. Um, one of the things that, that, I don't know, I'm off on a tangent here, but think about the way that the human body uh, protects itself. We don't have shells. We don't have, you know, insect, what do they call them, carapaces. Um, we, we take the hit. And we have an immensely active immune system that goes to work immediately to repair the damage. So there's no way that you're going to uh, protect a 19-year-old against taking the hits of war. You're not going to be able to do it. But if you can plant the seed so that when he comes back, that, that immune system, that healing system, kicks in way faster, that's the strategy. I, you know, I found your reflections on the experience of killing in combat, both insightful and at least to those of us who haven't done it, somewhat counterintuitive. Um, you talk both about the pleasure and about the, what you call the, the mystical quality of killing, even mm -hmm. if it's a religious aspects. So you said to Bill Moyers in this interview, our idea of religion in this culture is pretty much all sweetness and light. We like Christmas, we don't like Good Friday. Uh, could you comment on that? Yeah, um, you know, how I got onto that, that thought was I, I, I've done a lot of reading in, in comparative religion and uh, uh, mythology and stuff, and, and virtually all of the great religions have dark sides to them. And if you think about our own Native American religions, I mean, the Iroquois had ritual torture and the Aztecs, you know, cut people's hearts out. And I mean, there's darkness there. The Tibetans have you know, demons guarding the, guarding the gates to paradise, and you have to get through the demons. And even and Christianity, it's about a bloody ritual sacrifice of a god dying for his people. I mean, these are, these are things that are actually already in the religion, but the culture would rather have pixie dust. I mean, you know, it's just a lot more fun. I mean, you know, and, and so what, what then, like, that knowledge combined with this, this observation, which is this, that... All of, the, all of the mystical traditions, and I don't care if, if they're Sufis or if they're Christian mystics or if they're Hindu mystics, there's certain things they have in common when, when they uh, go through this mystical experience. The first one is they are always aware of death. They're always aware of death. 
that that we are mortal and death is you know Don Juan in in the uh, in the uh, Carlos Castaneda's book says death is right over our shoulder and you can you can see death. The other thing is that they're always in the present. I mean they do years of psychophysical exercises to be present, be present. Don't, don't get out of your head, you know, don't think of the past, it's not in the future, you're here now, it's the only time that's real, so they're present. The other thing is that they, they uh, try to sort of step away from their egos. In other words, um, they lose their egos, and they lose their egos uh, for a greater good, and for, for joining something larger. And they're all members of a group, generally, a, a convent, a, a, a monastery, the ulam, the sangha. I mean, every religion is, has these groups. And if you think about combat, absolutely every one of those things is present. Every one of them. And, and so I'm going like, well, is this a mystical experience then? It's certainly the equivalent of it. And, and when you, you know, and you think about, um, you know, well, Saint John of the Cross. I mean, he didn't. He didn't call it the uh, the lovely night of the soul. He called it the dark night of the soul. And there there is this darkness that we just have to start to recognize. That I mean, the whole the whole issue of evil. I mean, it 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 is around us. And and uh, you can't just sort of go go around saying, oh, well, that doesn't exist. Sorry, you know. Um, <laughs> one day I was in India. I spent a lot of time in India because I ran a corporation there. And um, I was getting off the train station in Calcutta, and a little girl was, was begging, and she had a cup hung around her neck because someone had cut off both of her hands so that she would get more money begging. And I mean, I, 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 was, I was reeling with that. I mean, the sense of evil that just hit me. I mean, I just, it, I, I, I didn't know where to put it and what to do with it. And so, Going back to the war experience and everything, I'm, you, you, it's the equivalent of sort of coming back from it, and it, it'd be like you know Saint John of the Cross comes comes out of the out of the out of the monastery, and we say, well, you can get a job at McDonald's, you know. I mean, it's just I mean we're talking about some kind of an experience that is just far beyond um, uh, an ordinary experience. And is it the other is it the the other side of the same coin, yin yang, the the dark, the light? Or is it just the equivalent? It doesn't make any difference in terms of its practicality. And the other thing that I talk about, and I think it's something we need to, to really own, there is a great thrill. I mean, I have never had a high like combat. And uh, you can't go around and tell people that, oh yeah, that war is hell. Yeah, it is hell. Um, but if you deny that there's a, that there's a great high, you're, you're, you're BS and whoever you're talking to, um, there is a big high. Uh, I remember uh, hitting a guy once uh, it, right in the head, and I felt great. I got him right between the eyes. I mean, I just felt great. Now, should I be proud of that? Should I? I don't know where to put that. But the f fact is, it was a feeling that I had, and, uh, and I've talked to other veterans, and they, they yeah, I kind of miss that. But it's like I tell people, it's like crack cocaine. Yeah, you can get high on crack, but boy, the costs, the costs of crack. And so that's what you always have to remember. But always bringing out this, this, this spiritual side and this, and this, this uh, excitement and, and high are, are truths that we have to speak about. You know, this is a point of privilege, but we were talking uh, upstairs just before we came down about our shared love of this Hindu classic, the Bhagavad Gita, which we read in my Stockdale course, but I think probably most American students are kind of surprised or have never heard of that book, but uh, you incorporated it pretty substantially into your book. Um, can you tell us what it is about the Gita, you think, that has a permanent message for people not of that culture, of Western culture? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's the Bhagavad Gita. I think it means the Song of God, and it's, it's part of the Mahabharata, which is a huge epic work of, of Indian literature. But this is, this is a poem, it's a long, long poem. And it, what it is, it's about a, a warrior whose name is Arjuna. And he is about to go into battle. And because it's a civil war, um, his, own, his own kin are on the opposite side. And he loses heart. He doesn't know what to do. He says, how can I kill, that's my cousin over there. How can I, how can I do this? And um, uh, 
the, the charioteer is actually, is it, is it Shiva? No. Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, yeah, blue Krishna. Krishna is the charioteer and has taken the, uh, incarnated as his charioteer. And so the whole dialogue is between Arjuna and Krishna in the form of his charioteer, giving him all the reasons why he should do it. And he goes through all the usual stuff. He tells him about, well, you know, you do it for your country. And you, well, you do it because of your manhood. You do it because, you know, you want to be brave. And you do it for all these reasons. And, and ultimately, um, it comes down to the fact that you just have to do it with your own noble heart, and you have to do it because you've been placed in this position, and you had nothing to do with that, and 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 that you just carry the role out that, that you've been assigned, and it's it's a really good piece of work because you see all the arguments, and they all fade after a while until you finally realize that for some reason, and you don't exactly know why, the gods or God placed you in this position, on this side. And you do have to remember that it is your kin on the other side that you're killing. And, uh, but you have to just, you carry it out because you're a warrior. And that's, that's what you've chosen to do. And um, that, that's, that's the basics of why I, I incorporated it. You know, decades after the events you went through in the war, you uh, describe in your book uh, an experience of uh, driving down the road at night and seeing the eyes of a Vietnamese soldier that you killed at close range. Um, can you talk a little about that experience and what that moment revealed to you about your mental and, mm. if you will, spiritual state about yeah. having killed so long ago? Well, um, you know, I have to tell you that the, a couple of things to preface that that particular vision that I had on I five at two in the morning. Um, the uh, uh, first of all, um, the the. The way that we can kill people is that, we're, is that they're not people. And, you know, the, the political correct say, oh, you, you can't dehumanize people. You go to boot camp and you learn to dehumanize people. And my answer to that is there is no other way a decent guy can kill anybody except to, except to, to dehumanize them. Because we've been taught all our lives, thou shalt not kill. And uh, suddenly you're 19 and, and, and they're, they're giving you, you know, all the messages that now we want you to go out there and kill. How do you do that? I, I use the word pseudo-speciating. You turn the enemy into an animal. Um, you know, haji, towel head, gook, kraut. I mean, we have words for it that'll go back millennium. And why? Because you can kill an animal. If that animal's trying to kill your friends, or if that animal's trying to kill you, you can pull the trigger way easier than if it's an actual human being. Well, what happened in, in this particular case is that we were on an assault, and it was a, a very steep hill. And uh, the NVA were, were in, entrenched in, in, in bunkers and in, and in fighting holes up above us. And, and it was probably, I mean, it was really steep. But, and and uh, uh, saw a couple of chai comms come, come flying down to us. And so we scrambled to get up, uphill so that they blow up down below us. But... Uh, I, I was slow off the mark, and it blew up right in front of me and knocked me out. Um, and when I came to, um, uh, the, there, were, there were two other guys with me, and they'd, they'd thrown a couple of grenades. And then Chai come, a couple more come flying down. And we scramble around to get out of the way, and we throw our grenades back. And a couple more come flying down. And uh, finally, the lieutenant's brain starts working, and I go like, this is not, I'm going to be out of grenades on the next throw. So we got to change tactics. And so I told the guys, I said, look, I'm going to get around to the, to, the, uh, to the left of this fighting position, which I know is right up above us. We couldn't see them. And I said, I want you to throw the grenades. And when they pop up to throw them back, I'll, I'll get them with the M16. And, and uh, just an aside, I, I always carried an M16. This thing about officers carrying 45s, I just thought that one went out the door the first day I got there, you know. Um, and um, so I, I got myself up there in position, and I was on the ground, and I was probably uh, closer to, to that hole than, than the front row here. It was close enough that I could see the, the kid's eyes. One of them had already been killed from one of our grenades he connected. And he stood up, and he had the grenade cocked. And I had him in my sights. I was laying on the ground, and, and I just had him at, in, in, at the end of the M16, and we locked eyes. Now, that doesn't happen very often. 
he was suddenly human. He wasn't a gook. He was, he was some 17-year-old kid scared to death. And, uh, and I remember whispering. I was whispering out loud. I knew he couldn't hear me because it was just the battles going on. And I don't speak Vietnamese, but I can remember saying, don't throw it. If you don't throw it, I won't pull the trigger. If you don't throw it, I won't pull the trigger. Because, see, if he was still an animal, I'd already killed him. But I, I, had to, I hesitated because he was human suddenly. And he snarled at me and threw it, and I killed him. And it was about you know, 20 years later, 1990, uh, that I'm driving down I-5, which is the north-south freeway and you know country western music on the radio and 2 o'clock in the morning. And I know a lot of veterans love that. You're in complete control, but you're going someplace. You have a goal, right? And, uh, um, and all of a sudden, in the windshield, I saw his eyes. And what that was, I mean, I'm sophisticated enough to know that, you know, that it's not the eyes that are there. What's happening is that my psyche is finally just saying, Marlanis, you got to deal with this. you got to deal with this. You killed a human being. It doesn't make any difference. The feeling is not one of guilt. The feeling is one of, I carry the burden, and I'm very sad. Uh, I was in a war, and I was doing my bit and trying to be on my side, just like he was, but he was human. And that's what started me really writing the second book, is how do you come to terms with, with all that? And what it was is this, this idea that pseudo-speciation drops uh, sometimes, and it's necessary to drop immediately after the fight. I mean, that's where I think atrocities come from, because we stay in that mode. Well, you talk about the importance of being part of a, feeling a part of a team or even an organism yeah. as what one of the moral armors that mm -hmm. allows you to do this. And as you tell that story, it sounds to me like uh, one of the things that's key about that moment, for, for that moment, you're not part of your team anymore. You're right. face to face with a, yeah. another human being. Totally. Individual. I think that's absolutely good. That's a good insight because, you see, you, you have these, these, these you, could, you could call them, you know, uh, some, some psychologist who would psycho, psych, psychologize it would say, well, you have these psychological protections about pseudo-speciation and being part of the group and not an individual. And uh, I think that all those things are, are true. I think that that group feeling, though, is, is far beyond just trying to protect your psyche against, against the killing. It's, that's, that's what actually, uh, that's where you lose your ego completely. And uh, I, I can remember this feeling of being, being the group. I wasn't me anymore. And so in that sense, um, there was no, no sense of me dying. Now, I was in a, this isn't, this isn't, I mean, I wasn't like this except for brief, brief moments of time in the middle of combat. The rest of the time, I'm sitting around being scared to death all the time. But, but, but at that moment, I lost that sense of who I was. I was just this marine unit, and we are invincible. I mean, I could die, but there's no way they're going to stop this marine unit. And if this marine unit dies, then by God, the whole corps is going to show up, and there's just no way it's going to stop. So there's this sense of immortality that comes from the group that I think is, is extremely important and, and contributes to that, that mystical sense and that feeling that you come back from that to humdrum. And it's tough to reintegrate. Yeah, you brought it up at the end, but as you were speaking, I was thinking that's precisely a kind of description of mystical self-absorption, mm -hmm. loss of self. Yeah. Um, and mystics report they rarely attain it and keep it for any length of time, but remember it, it's it is very the finest fleeting. moment that's of right. their lives. And they can never explain it. Never explain it. Yeah, it's ineffability. Yeah. It's I, I, can't, I can't describe it to you, but uh, yeah, I was there, but you know, I was there for a brief moment, and I, I wish I could get it back, but I don't want to pay what I paid to get that one. I mean, one of the great, so, talking to some guys, is like, what, what about your Vietnam experience? And he says, well, he says, um, I wouldn't trade it for a million dollars, but I wouldn't pay a nickel to do it again. It's a good explanation. And one of the most dramatic scenes I found in the book is when you describe this moment when your soldiers, uh, your Marines started cutting off the ears of the enemy and sticking the ears in their helmet bands and mm -hmm. um, presented you with a sort of leadership challenge of how you're going to deal with that. Can you... Uh, yeah. About yeah. It, it was. We'd been we'd been fighting for several days, and uh, the enemy had stacked. You know, not stacked up. I mean, that's an exaggeration. But there were dead bodies uh, right below our fighting holes, and uh, you know, I'm walking the lines. And after we'd had a contact that night, and 
all of a sudden I see a, notice one of the kids, and I'm talking kids, 18 years old, and he's got he's got a, a couple of ears in the in, in the rubber band that's around the helmet, you know, and then I see another kid, and he's got a couple of ears in there, and I just, you know, I'd been there a long time by that time, and, and it didn't shock me. I mean, I mean the carnage that you see in in you know infantry combat is just, I mean, a couple of years is nothing, but I realized that that you know you just can't let this pass because this is desecration of the enemy. And what had happened is just what I was talking about earlier, is that they were just dead animals. And these guys were just collecting antlers. I mean, that's what, they, that's what so it's Letterman jackets, trophies. I mean, that's, that's the, where their heads were. They weren't trying to sort of, um, you know, I don't know what the word is, uh, desecrate the enemy to, to, to shame them or something like that. They were just collecting antlers, just like they'd shot a deer that, that morning. And they put it on their helmets because they were proud of it. So I went up to them and I said, you know, I understand. They killed your friends and, you know, you killed their friends and you killed them. And I said, you just can't do this. I mean, these are, these are human beings. And so I want you to go down there and bury them. Take the ears back and bury those bodies. Now, this was not trivial because we were still getting shot at. It was, it was occasional sniper fire. Um, so, you know, no one wanted to get out of their hole again. And, uh, and, but anyway, they went down there and they started digging and they, and these, they both started crying. They just both started crying. And what hit me is that suddenly they were burying human beings. They had regained their humanity in the ritual of putting a body into the ground. And we don't do that. Had you not done that, what do you think the consequences would have been? Well, I think that if I had not done that, that would have been, hey, the lieutenant just winked. You know, or uh, I guess it's okay. You know, I mean, I think that, I mean, I think it's just that simple. It's like, you know, I could have said, uh, "Oh, that's stupid" or whatever. But if I didn't take an action on it, uh, it, it would be quite clear that it's okay to cut ears. In fact, in you know, there were there were commanders in Vietnam that that said, "I'm going to see ears. We're not going to call it a KIA until I see the ears cut off the head." Come on, you know, this is that tough guy bullshit that you know I just they just cringe about, you know. And, and um, I think that, that right there and then, if I had not acted on it, the next step would be, you know, peeing on the bodies. I mean, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's just uh, you, have to, so you have to hold the standards. And even though I wasn't angry at them, I, didn't, I don't judge them morally because, like I said, I just knew where they were coming from. They were collecting deer antlers, but that, that had to stop. And uh, when it did stop, I think they felt bad about it. You know, when we first talked on the phone, uh, uh, you mentioned that you had just given a talk at the Naval Academy, mm -hmm. and you were surprised where the midshipmen put their focus in your book, right, right. on the story of P. Dog and his little marijuana cigarette. Um, and I actually thought a lot about that, both the conversation and why that was. I said, I think I can explain to you why the midshipmen obsessed about that. Let me, let me hear that, that. Message, yeah. Because they've been trained in a very simplistic moral code that tells them it's always wrong to lie. Yeah, And yet in the story that you give, it seems to me anybody of even moderate moral maturity would say absolutely lie about the cigarette. Yeah. So I wonder if you could tell the story. And okay. Uh, uh. Yeah. Uh, P-Dog is, is a, a made-up name for, for uh, I'll tell this group, is a, is a kid named Warner who was just a, one of the great machine gunners. And he was, uh, I think he, well, he was you know, just out of high school and went to boot camp and came over there. So he must have been 19 or late 18. And he'd been there for a long time. And he, he, he is what is called a 12 and 20. In other words, he, he only had, he had less than 10 days in country. And so uh, we usually let him, let him off of ops if they only had 10 days ago, because they were pretty much useless anyway. They're wearing three flak jackets and hiding in, you know, <laughs> 30 feet under their, you know. So it's like, might as well send them back. And, um, and I had been uh, just transferred back to the, to the rear. I, I took over the uh, S1 job and uh, I was called the S1 Zulu, but uh, the S1 was, was an alcoholic that spent all of his time reading porn magazines. And so, you know, I, I took over the, the job basically and um, uh, get a call one night and it's like, we got, we got three kids from your battalion down here. They've been caught with uh, uh, smoking uh, marijuana. Well, back in those days, smoking marijuana was a dishonorable discharge. And it was like three strikes, you're out. 
there was no like you know well mitigating circumstances it was like you were smoking dope dishonorable discharge and and uh, p dog had been you know had had been a great marine and he was just hanging out well so I go over to another, it was in another battalion, and they, they got them all, you know, uh, spread eagled uh, uh, with their hands on a bench and, you know, so that they couldn't, couldn't uh, reach their pockets or anything. And the, the duty NCO over there said, well, these, these three guys are yours, they're not mine. So I said, okay. And I said, well, let's get in the Jeep. So I put them in the Jeep, and I was with, with uh, one, of the, one of the sergeants, a clerk, and uh, I'm halfway over back to where the battalion uh, Hooch was, I, I, I said, you know, sort of like, I have to go to the, I take a pee, and you do too, don't you, Sergeant? And so we stopped the Jeep, and we just turned our backs on him, and we could hear all this fumbling and throwing, and, you know, people's going through their pockets like mad trying to get rid of the, of the, of the joints. And we got back in, the, and I thought, well, it's problem solved. So I got back to the, uh, to the battalion Hooch, and it goes 24-7, and there was probably about, I don't know, eight or ten clerks there and, and a, a gunnery sergeant. Uh, and um, so I line them up and I say, okay, we're gonna search your pockets and you know, ah, ah, like that. Well, um, Warner had, had been wounded and, and, and he still had a bandage on and he fumbled and, and, and out, of, out of, he had put a, cigarette, a marijuana cigarette, I, he told me later, I met him just about a month ago and talked about it. It didn't come out of his pocket, like I said in the book, he, he said it came out of the, the bandage in his arm. But anyway, popped right out on the floor in front of everybody a joint, and you know, and if you ever see, I, I, if you ever want to see a black kid turn white, <laughs> it was when 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 his joint hit the ground, and I mean, and I just I told the other two because they were clean. I said, "You get out of here," and they just psh, they're gone. Now here I am, I've got a career uh, staff NCO, and eight witnesses that just saw a guy pop a joint on the floor, dishonorable discharge, and I so I said to the the, the gunnery sergeant, I said, "Gunny." I know this kid, he was in my platoon, he's a good Marine. I think that's tobacco. And this guy, he looked at me and he looked at, at he says, he says, I don't know. He says, uh, if you say he's a good Marine, and he reached down, he picked up this joint and you know, it's just like back in boot camp. He marches around and sticks it under everybody's nose, one by one. Is this a marijuana or is this tobacco? It's tobacco, Gunny. Is this marijuana? It's tobacco, Gunny. And he comes back to me, he says, well, Lieutenant, I guess it's tobacco. And Warner just got out of there like that. You know. And the, the midshipman couldn't get around that. You lied. I mean, and I was surprised. Every class, that was one of the questions. How did you, and they were really struggling with it. They were really struggling with it. And I, I tried to explain it to him. I said, look, I said, we all know that the helmsman has to do what the captain says, right? And if you give him a course, like, you know, 360, that's what he's supposed to do. He doesn't make up his own mind to suddenly go 270, right? He does 360. But I said, if he sees rocks, the reason for the rule is to get to your destination, right? Yeah. Well, then he has to go around the, he has to break the rule, doesn't he, in order to achieve what the rule is trying to accomplish. You know, you can see the wheels turning, and 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 I said, what are what are what are rules about? It's about how an organization functions. The marijuana rule was about functioning. You don't want people high on dope if they're supposed to be doing their jobs. And but on the other hand, this guy wasn't doing anything that was wrong. And I said, and and the reason you have rules is also it's about fairness. It's about justice. And I said, if if we sent him with a dis to 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 a Portsmouth Naval Prison and gave him a dishonorable discharge after all he had done, is that justice? Yeah, but you lied, and he broke the you know. I mean, it was. I mean, to me, that argument's dead simple, but it wasn't to them. Well, no, and having taught at an academy with uh, perhaps even a more rigid honor code at the Air Force Academy than at the Naval Academy, I know what the party line would be. We. <laughs> Well, I mean, the sense of the non-toleration rule is there. And <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, sure. So, you know, but you get these downright rabbinic trying to parse these cases about what's a lie, what's not a lie. Yeah. But, you know, and maybe at the level of an 18 or 22 or 20 old where you're trying to get them to think um, at least straight about moral questions, maybe oversimplification is necessary. But 
at some point, the kind of more mature moral reasoning you engaged in on the spot is something every mature adult in that room immediately recognizes yeah. an appropriate course of action. So any thoughts about when we let it be complicated? Well, you know, I mean, gosh, I, that wasn't on your list. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that the higher in rank you go, the more complicated you can handle as a, as a, a maturing individual and the more complex the issues become. In other words, if, if, if uh, um, somebody is 18, it, maybe the best way to do it is to just say, give him some rules. But then I think that, that, that uh, it's quite clear by the time you're, you're a, a field grade officer, or whatever you call a field grade in the Navy, um, that, that it gets, it ain't black and white. You know, it's, it's, it, everything's got this sort of shades of gray. And, and so the higher rank, the higher your maturity, I think you have to let it in. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate to, to try and, and move that kind of thinking down to a 19 year old. I, th I think that quite frankly, um, they're capable if somebody takes the time. The easy thing to do is to say, thou shalt not, right? Uh, thou shalt not smoke marijuana cigarettes. And then they'll go off and do it on a weekend you know, and then people will say, well, and then your friends are doing it, and then if your friends are doing it, then how come it's not for everything? You know, you can tell a 19-year-old that kind of stuff, yeah, so I'm kind so. of on the side of, of, of educating. You talk about another event many years after Vietnam where you bumped your head on a, a cupboard, another when someone honked at you at a stoplight, both of which revealed your PTSD to you. Mm -hmm. can, you can you describe sure. those events? Sure. Um, one of the things that a lot of people, you, most people in this room, I mean, I'll, I'll, maybe somebody in this room doesn't know this, but a lot of people might. Uh, you know, PTSD is, is, is a physiological issue. I mean, people tend to psych, psychologize it. It certainly, has the, it certainly has psychological issues, and there certainly are moral, spiritual issues to it. But quite frankly, what happens is that it, your brain, uh, the organization of your brain changes in combat under extreme adrenaline loads, apparently. If you hear a sound, uh, the input, whether it's taste, smell, whatever, goes through the cerebral cortex if you're in normal civilian mode. And it's like, I wonder what that is. I wonder, could it be the wind? Or, or maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's a leaf falling or a bird or something. Oh, or maybe it's an NVA soldier. And, you know, by that time, well, you're dead, all right? So what happens is that the brain rewires. And, and the statistics are pretty clear that it's early in, in someone's tour that they, that they get it the odds are of making it through the tour increase the longer you're there. And I think a big part of that is because your brain you know, rewires in a healthy way to protect you in combat. And so the wiring goes directly to the amygdala. The amygdala is the fight, flight, freeze, reptilian response. There's a sound and you shoot it. There is no thought. You just wheel around and pull the trigger and blast it, you know, full automatic. And then you figure out what it is. That's when the thinking comes back and starts kicking in again. Well, what happened is that, like, I, I was in the kitchen and I bumped my head on a cupboard that had been left open, probably by me, because my wife's always shutting the cupboards, you know. And, uh, and it surprised me. And I turned around and I took the whole thing out with my fists. I mean, there was cans and broken crockery and uh, cups and uh, glasses. I mean, the floor was, I mean, the, and splinters. I mean, I took, I mean, my hands were bleeding before I finally started thinking again. And then, you know, my kids come in, and it's like, talk about frightening to a little family. It's like, gosh, dad just took out the, the, the kitchen cabinets, you know, with his fist. You know. What's going on? And the same thing happened in this, at this intersection. I was, I was a little slow off the mark because I didn't quite know where I was going. And I had my little girl Sophie with me and, and uh, a guy blasts the horn behind me. Again, I don't remember anything between the horn blast and becoming aware that I was trying to kick his windshield in. I was on the hood of his car. And when I come to my senses, in other words, the cortex comes in again, I look back and there in the middle of the intersection is my car with the door open and my five-year-old girl sort of, you know, what's dad doing on this other guy's car? And this other guy, luckily he didn't have an Uzi or something with him, I mean, he'd been dead, but, but uh, that's, that's that, that instantaneous reaction and no longer thinking. And uh, it's very hard to turn around. Uh, there's medicine and there's, and, but, and the, the most important thing is awareness. Uh, I, I saw a lot of VA therapists, and I had some good ones. I was really very happy with them. 
Uh, and now, if, if a guy comes up behind me and he blasts the horn, I still go into like this. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's just like my whole body just goes like that, and I, and I start to shake. But I've been trained. I go 10, 9, take a deep breath, 8. It's just some asshole who's had a bad day at work. 7, <laughs> 6, 5. He's not trying to kill you. 3, 2, you know. And then I just drive on. I mean, I'm shaking for a half an hour, but I don't make a fool of myself, nor do I endanger, you know, everybody in the intersection. And uh, uh, that, but I had never heard of PTSD, never heard of it. And, I, and, and my family thought I was going crazy. Uh, and it was, uh, so that's, those are the two instances that I began to go like, something's wrong here. One of the, uh, I guess, I don't know how to put this, uh, oddest, most difficult to assimilate, strangest, but very authentic things in your book is this description of this presence of evil in your house mm. um, and your need to deal with that through various kind of ritual means. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's probably outside the experience of many people in the room, but yeah. clearly very real for you. Very real. Um, so I, I well, know it's difficult. But you no, it's fine. I mean, I wrote it in a book. I'm not going to be coy and say I'm going to talk about it. You yeah. know. Um, the... Um, what happened was, was um, I, I was doing a lot of more crazy things than that. I mean, like I'd hear a sound outside and I'd find myself outside naked in the neighborhood trying to see where the sound was coming from, you know. This is not normal behavior. And uh, so my wife said to me, she says, that she was reading in the paper, there's, there's a local um, um, uh, uh, workshop put on by the county psych psychologists and, and they're sort of, you know, talking about job stress. I think you've got some job stress to deal with, you know. <laughs> we didn't know it, but so I went, went to this guy and, and, uh, he, and he started asking me questions about the symptoms and stuff. And I'm in, a, in the school cafeteria with about 80 people there and, and uh, I described it to him and he looks at me and he says, were you ever in a war? And I break down sobbing, just snot coming out of my nose and I mean, I cried for about 20 minutes and he he said to me, he says, you got PTSD. Have you ever heard of it? No. He says, I want you to go down and see this guy. And I wrote down the name Larry Decker, who is a VA psych psychologist who was at the Veterans Outreach Center down in Santa Barbara. And um, uh, I went down there and I started that, that process. And during the, in the course of that process, Decker had said to me, he says, you know, I've never seen anybody come to terms with PTSD without a spiritual component. He says, I don't care if it's Buddhist or if it's, you know, artwork. He says, or Lutheran, I don't care. But he says, I have never seen anybody get through it without a spiritual component. So I said, okay. So I went, if you believe this, I went to the yellow pages. And I went under, under religion, our church or something, and I went to see who the closest one was to my house. And it was an Episcopal church. And I, so I knock on the door, and, I, and he's in his office, the priest, and he says, what can I do for you? And I said, well, I'm trying to cure PTSD, and I need a spiritual component. So, I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, too much marine training, you know. It's like, uh, um, so, so anyway, he says, well, you know, that ain't, that's not my line, but there's, a, there's a, a, a Capuchin monk who's at a monastery up the valley here who has been dealing with veterans. And so I said to him, I said, well, Okay, so I go up there, and his name is Brother, Brother David, and um, he starts to talk to me about spirituality, and we start to deal with the spiritual side, and he, he, one, one day he says to me, he says, um, you know, there's an old ritual in the church that we don't use anymore. It's called the Mass for the Dead, but he says it's, a, it's where you actually talk to the dead people, and I'm kind of going, uh-huh, right. You know, he says, no, he says... You got to take it seriously. He says, I, if, we, if you want to do this, I'll do this with you. And I said, okay. And he says, what I want you to do is I want you to write down all the things you want to say to all the people that died over there. Ones you killed, ones that were killed with you. So I prepared for that. And that, and that night, we had that ritual, just Brother David and myself in, a, in the old Mission San Inez in a dark and stormy night. And it was incredible because uh, we went down and opened these giant doors about two in the morning and I could feel spirits coming in and you know you're going like yeah all right you know my experience I could feel spirits coming in and I went up to the front of the church and I thought this I could see guys from Vietnam and I'm going like okay you know they're not there but they're there you know they're not there but they're there and you know you're in this sort of in between hypnagogic sort of state 
And then I saw my grandparents walk in. Now, I did not expect that. And they sat in the front row. And uh, so we went through that whole ritual, and I talked to these people. I talked to people that I hated. I had some evil I really hated. And uh, I just realized that they were in over their heads, sort of like I was. And, uh, and I talked to guys I killed. I talked to guys that, that I thought had died because I made mistakes. And when we get through all that, we go back. This is, this is his point. I had to build you up the story. Uh, I, the night after that ritual, I'm in my bedroom all by myself. And uh, there was this presence that came into the room. And I cannot explain how dark and evil that presence was. It just terrified me, and it was filling the room. And and I'm a pretty rational guy, actually, you know, in spite of all this crazy stuff I write about. But and I'm going like, is this really happening? And it was like, this is really happening. And I, I grabbed a crucifix and I, I started, you know, you know, praying to every saint I could think of, and Jesus and Mary, and you know, it, it was it was amazing. And finally, you know, this this presence leaves the room. And I hustle down to see Brother David about six in the morning. I, you know, Brother David, we got trouble. <laughs> and he's he's going like, you know, he says, I don't know. He said we may have we may have just uncorked something that we don't know what to deal with. And uh, so he called a guy in his order who was at the Vatican and um, uh, who had, who was an expert on this particular ritual. And what the guy said is, he says, when evil starts to lose its hold it'll fight very hard not to lose its hold. And what you've done is you've, you've started that process. And so Brother David came over and, and he sprinkled holy water around and that sort of thing, and the next night the same thing happened. Well, I was pretty shaken up, but by this time I was in this PTSD group in, in Santa Barbara. And this, is, this is, goes back to what we're, I'm talking about way earlier, what we're talking about. There was a guy in that group whose, whose name was Bear. And he was a Chumash Indian, and he was a long-range uh, alert, long-range uh, reconnaissance patrol guy uh, uh, in Vietnam. And his, and he, you know, and he, he he's after the after the the, the group meeting, he, he he comes over, he says, he says, God, you didn't say a thing. He says, that's really not like you. <laughs> and I said, yeah, and I I told him about this, and he said, you know, my great uncle is a shaman. He says, um, that's evil spirits. He said, we, we know how to deal with that. I said, great. He said, no, no, no. I said, you wait right here. I was at, he was at a coffee shop. He said, wait right here. He said, I'm going to go talk to my uncle. He says, I'll be, I'll be back, be, maybe an hour or so. So I'm sitting there waiting for my coffee, and, and, and Bear comes back with a cassette tape uh, that his uncle had made for me and, and, a, and a bowl of white sage and green sage. And he says, okay. And he says, now, my uncle's going to be chanting. I want you to play this in your house. And I want you to light these on fire. And I want you to go around all the corners and the four winds and stuff. And he says, and, and, and then try and chant along with my uncle. And, and it'll be all right. We, we do evil spirits. And I did that. And he never came back. And uh, <laughs> the, 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 the funniest thing about it, I, I, I said, well, I think I, you know, I, I joined the Catholic Church after that because it seemed to be a home for me. And then I think it was Higgins over here. He said, geez, Marlanis, you should have become a Chumash. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have one last question, so please prepare your own. We've got some time off, so my last question is this. Um, toward the ending of the book, you write, uh, and I'm quoting, I'm constantly told, usually by people who have never been to war and who apply varying degrees of simplistic reasoning, that all is fair in love and war, that having rules of war is total nonsense. This is simply not true. To sink to the position that fair play and the impulses of good character have no place in modern war, taking some sort of tough guy realo politique stance is something the ethical warrior must never do. As we wrap up this ethics symposium today, I'd like you to elaborate on that thought. Yeah. Um, first of all, if you're an ethical warrior, you're fighting for something that is worth fighting for. If you're fighting for money or for power, uh, I don't think you're ethical. And the very thing that this, this nation thinks is worth fighting for are, are ideas like fair play, mercy, justice. So if you don't exhibit this 
yourself when you're fighting for those ideals you're putting yourself into a terribly tip hypocritical position and and one that's very very difficult for you to argue your way out of it's like oh yeah i really believe in these things but right now i don't so the first thing is that, is it is that you you have to you have your actions have to line up with what you should be fighting for which are those those kinds of ethical ideals the second thing is on a very practical level uh, well, it's both practical and moral. I mean, there's the golden rule that every religion has, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you were in the situation of, of uh, you know, uh, well, the example I use is that in World War II, uh, von Luck, who was a, a German uh, armored reconnaissance guy, was out in the desert, and they got caught flat-footed and uh, by it looked like RAF, but he said he thought it was a Canadian air, aircraft. It was a Spitfire. And... Uh, it, it came rolling in and, and hit them hard, and uh, they scattered. And uh, one of the soldiers had to go back because the radio was there. He needed to retrieve the radio. And the Spitfire rolled in again. Now, the man was totally defenseless. He was on top of one of these armored recon things, and all these things had been hit hard. I mean, they were going nowhere. And that Canadian pilot just tipped his wing and just went right by the guy and, and let him live. That's an image that has stayed with me a long time. If you were that guy, would you have, would you have wanted the pilot to say, well, the guy will come back to fight again, you know, so kill him now. You know, I mean, that's that tough guy stuff. Well, the fact is, is that the, the, that armored reconnaissance patrol was defunct. It was done. Its mission was aborted. It could not go anywhere further. I mean, I don't know how they got out of it alive because their, their, their vehicles were shot up. So just... On a, on a practical and also a philosophical thing, if you were in that situation, you would want your enemy to behave the same way. And then finally, you're going to have to make peace with these people. The war is going to be over at some point. And if you've behaved badly, the chances of a, of a peace coming along are very compromised, as opposed to if you behaved well. Because there's going to be a sense of, well, I think we're there. I think it's going to be okay if we surrender. We're not going to get, you know, tortured and, and uh, have our families burned down, uh, whatever they would imagine, because of your your conduct. So there's an ethical, moral reason for behaving that way, and there's also a very practical reason for for behaving that way, for keeping rules of warfare and and keeping to them. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks so much, Carl. Yeah. That's been wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do.